Well, let me see. I think my first experience with kite flying was when I was about eight. We'd buy this Japanese kite called a Yakko-san kite. It was very colorful with its long tail and painted warrior face. In those days, we paid about a nickel or a dime for it, out where I lived on Terminal Island, California. Since flying Yakko-san kite, I have built and flown all kinds of kites from all over the world. Kites come from many different places, but I like making the kites from Asia best. The fast Korean, Thai, and Indian fighting kites, the intricate Chinese kites, the beautiful Japanese kites, all these excite me. I like their design and the way they fly. Their materials, just simple bamboo and rice paper, feel closest to me. My father came to America in 1900. He and many other Japanese settled on Terminal Island because the fishing was so good there. When my parents arrived in America, they found plenty of work to do. My father fished for mackerel and tuna. My mother packed fish in the canneries. Because my parents were always gone to work, us kids had to be independent. We went to school by ourselves. We came back and played games by ourselves. We even cooked dinner by ourselves. We'd always get in trouble with our teachers. Like we talked Japanese so much in school that they used to have a special day where no one could speak Japanese, only English. I think the reason I have an accent today was because we learned to speak Japanese first. It's hard to believe that this island in San Pedro could be so much like Japan. Our holidays were Japanese too. In grammar school on May 5th, we used to celebrate Boys Day. To this day, we still fly the same koi banners that we did then. When the wind blew, the koi seemed like they were swimming, swimming in the sky. My mother would tell me what Boys Day was like in Japan, how in cities and small villages, kids would celebrate like I did by flying koi banners. I think most of how the koi waved in the wind and how bright its colors in the sun were. When I think of kites, I wonder who flew the first one. You know, I remember some stories of what might have led to the birth of kites. The first kite was created in China, and it could have been by this archer. He might have gotten tired of chasing arrows or something and said, I can tie a string to my arrow and make life easier for myself. Man, I wonder if he didn't have some problems with his invention. Maybe this girl, hard at work, had tied her straw hat to a post to keep it out of her way. In a moment, I'll bet she turns around to see her hat flying like a kite. I want to tell you about Polynesian fishing kites. First of all, they make these kites from leaves and branches and go out to sea to fly them. From each kite drops a fishing line made from vines. And the fish are full. There's nothing they can see in the water except the bait. To go fishing and fly kites too. And to come home and eat fresh fish, this is just too much. There was once a Chinese general. Now, this general was in really bad shape. His army was trapped by the army of Emperor Fu Han, and he didn't know how to escape. Then, he had an idea. He gathered all the spears and paper he could find, plus all the archer's bows. He quickly made the bones of a large kite and tied the archer's bow to it. Weird. Anyways, his army made many more kites and quietly flew them in the night. The wind took those kites right over Emperor Fu Han's sleeping army. Then, the strings of those bulls began to humming.
In old China, a man once had his fortune read, and it was terrible. On the ninth day of the ninth month of that year, he would lose his family, his farm, everything. But this man said to himself, I'm not going to worry about it. And on the ninth day of the ninth month, took his family on a kite flying picnic. A, a kite nick. <laughs> when they returned home, that guy was pretty mad. But he also must have been very grateful too. Wow, man. Each year, for many years after that day, he would take his family to fly kites. Many more people joined him in his celebration, and soon all of China flew kites on the ninth day of the ninth month of each year. Now, I like to tell you a story about the kite crazy town called Shirone. I mean, where else do local businesses sponsor kites that fight each other? They proudly display their six foot tall fighters in front of their shops, and for one whole week, all the talk in town is about the kite fights. People get all excited about them. In the largest of the Shirone kite fights, each team fly 20 foot tall kites painted with kabuki warrior faces. The two teams duel with their kites across a river, each trying to cut the other down. And when they tangle, the whole village joined in the tug of war. They pull and they tug, everyone helping, even the dogs. The kite we're going to be making today is called the Thailand Snake Kite. And the way she flies is the head part will move this way and the tail will move like this. And it really looks neat up there. Now get your scissors and cut this pattern out. We want to make sure that every kite flies. If it doesn't fly, then you bring it back to me. Do we have enough markers? Here we are. What color would you like? Ben? What color would you like? You take green? Okay. Let me, let me see how far you got. Does everything gain that? And that's real neat, I think. No, it's colorful. Now look at this one. Let me, just, just, let me see a little bit. Oh, brother, isn't that neat? I would buy this for a dollar. Any day. <laughs> Looking back, I think people should learn to make their own kites. And if it gets up there, that's an accomplishment. It's almost magic seeing this creation of wood, paper, and string fly. And it all shows on their faces, the expression, the feeling, because it's just like a fish for the first time. You can feel everything. 
what the fish is doing, diving deeper, trying to go into the rocks, and a kite will pull and lean and dive too. And you can feel every little move. And you know, it really is a part of you flying up there too, on a string. Yeah, I guess it's really just you. Thank you.